Great. So um, thank you to everyone who's here, and I think in particular to everyone who is online. Um, we're going to get started. I'm sorry about us starting a few minutes late, but we just needed to um, set things up. So um, welcome to the session of the Dynamic Coalition on uh, Public Access in Libraries this year. Um, we're conscious that there are three different lengths of session given on the IGF website, um, but we're going to go with the one that gives us most time. Um, so we're going to go for the 90 minutes that we think we have, um, um, and if someone turns up, we'll have to stop. Um, so um, the focus of this session is on um, evolutions in public access, evolutions in, in the nature of public access, as a contribution, as part of the broader infrastructure, as part of the broader means that we have of ensuring that there is meaningful connectivity for everyone. And my name is Stephen Weiber. I work for the International Federation of Public uh, International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Um, so, the reason why we are talking about this one this year is that just under 20 years ago um, in Tunis, um, the world came together and put together the plan of action for the World Summit on the Information Society. And they said lots of things, um, but one of the things they said was that it was important to have um, multi-purpose community public access points, providing affordable or free of charge access for citizens to various communication resources, including the internet. And that these access points should have sufficient capacity to provide assistance to users. And the first example that they gave on this list in 2003 was libraries. And on this basis, the P Dynamic Coalition on Public Access and Libraries was created around 10 years ago in order to explore this, in order to develop thinking on this idea, to bring together different actors, to reflect on what does it mean, what does it include, and how can we maximize this impact. Um, now, of course, we are almost 20 years later, and we're getting to the stage where we're beginning to think about, well, what's going to be there in the WISIS plus 20 agenda? What elements of that plan of action and those action lines from between 2003 and 2005 are still relevant, still have their place? How effective have those ideas set out in 2003 actually been? And so the exam question for today, which we have probably 90 minutes to answer, is effectively how has the nature and place of public access and libraries in the wider connectivity landscape evolved over the last 20 years? Now, in advance of this session, um, we went out and we asked a few people what their thoughts were. Now, how had they seen the role, the contribution of public access changing over that time? And so we've already just this morning put out uh, an initial report, very much a draft version, focusing on what those expert views are, what those experiences are. We've got the QR code up on the screen in order to, to take a look at this. I'd note, of course, this is a zero draft, and one of the key outcomes, one of the things we're really looking to achieve from this session is to bring in further ideas, to get further inspiration about what those evolutions are so that we can really understand how it's changed, how we would hope it's still relevant today. Um, so there are already some conclusions, some key themes that have emerged from those, those contributions. The first set are to do with that, and the things that I think are, we're calling eternal. So uh, factors, characteristics that mean that public access and libraries should technically always be relevant, should always be useful as a way of ensuring meaningful connectivity. Um, first of all, there's simply the ongoing relevance of that fundamental mission to work through information, through knowledge, in order to provide access to the information for development. So that transformational connection between making the link between people and knowledge in order to deliver change, better lives, better decision making. Another ongoing function is, while of course a much larger share of the global population is online now than was the case in 2003, there are still billions of people who do not have access to the internet. And we know that for many, Maybe the internet's available, but they don't see the value, they don't see the interest, they don't feel the confidence necessary to get online or to invest in some of their own private connectivity. So there's still that first taste of the internet for the unconnected as a function. But there are also some ideas that have come out that focus on what are the evolutions, what's actually changed in there. So a first point, and perhaps this wasn't clear back in 2003, but it's become increasingly clear that 
public access is not an alternative to private access. It's not in competition with private access, but rather as our understanding of what a full and meaningful engagement with the internet looks like. Um, public access has come out, has been demonstrated to be complementary, offering possibilities to do different things, to do the same things differently as you would at home with your own devices. We've seen it becoming clearer that public access has the possibility to be flexible. It's not a set thing that only needs to be provided in one way, in one context. It's been able to provide a way means of responding. A really strong example was during the COVID crisis. Back in 2003, public access may not have been seen as part of crisis response, but between tw from 2020 onwards, we saw libraries really working out how they could step in, how public access could actually step up, complement education, complement employment, complement efforts in other policy areas in order to make sure that people could continue with their lives. And so that broader function, that broader role that it plays is becoming clearer. Um, we've seen public access proving its ability, proving its possibility to help realize the potential of new connectivity solutions. I think we'll hear talk shortly, I think, a little bit about how public libraries are proving that they're a good place to actually make use of, to actually turn the potential of, for example, low Earth orbit satellites into reality, into real change on the ground. And so pu public libraries can be that first opportunity, that first contact, and actually help realize that potential. We've seen it as providing a response to shocks. Um, we'll hear a little bit further later about the role of libraries as second responders, as organizations, as places where even in emergencies, even in disasters, public access plays a key role backing up, supporting, making sure that when private connection isn't possible, people can still get online, can still carry on with their lives as best possible. We've seen libraries prove their ability to work in partnership. Um, Libraries, of course, bring much to the table, but they're even more powerful when they can work with other people, when they can work with other organizations that bring in skills, that bring in programs, that bring in activities, and really combining public access with other things. Public access doesn't exist on its own, but it can be really mobilized, it can be utilized when we actually work with other partners. And finally, we're seeing examples, and we're seeing public access become a basis a sine qua non for actually helping people explore new technologies, new tools, new possibilities that may be open to them. And so by having public access, libraries become a kind of sandpit, a place where people can get to, get, get to discover things, find new possibilities, be creative, and then potentially adopt personally. So these are just some of the ideas that appear in that zero draft of our report. And um, clearly what we're trying to do here is dig further gather new ideas, gather new perspectives that hopefully we can really use to develop that report to produce something really helpful. So, um, just before we go on to our speakers, um, we have a Mentimeter set of slides um, <coughs> that will hopefully be, um, starts, I don't know, helps you to sort of engage and start thinking. So, um, for our participants online in particular, I hope that you can see at the top of the screen that you should go to menti.com and with the code 19088703, if I can read properly. Um, and so idea, what we're interested in is getting an idea at the start of the session on what you think, your in initial impressions of this role and I think the evolving role and the continued role of public access within a broader framework, within a broader set of um, policies in order to ensure meaningful connectivity. So we'll give people a couple of, give people a minute to respond on this. Great, first response in. Glad to see people being very positive. <laughs> it's always interesting, I think, on the second answer that you can see that there's some people who are very favorable and some people who are believe that public access may compete. So actually having that, no, it's always interesting when you have that difference in views. Let's go for a minute or so more. We've had a few responses. Excellent. 
Excellent. Okay, so it's good. I think we've got. I know. I, I I was hoping that we could use this as an evaluation metric, and that at the end of the session, people would give even higher scores than they do now. But there's not much room for improvement. So I think we'll just have to give up on that as, as, as an evaluation metric for ourselves this time. Um, but anyway, so thank you for those initial views, but um, we will be asking those questions again later, but also giving opportunities for you to feed in. But um, what I'd like to do now is actually hand over to our speakers. And so we're going to get a series of uh, contributions. We're going to get a series of, of um, ooh, I've got the biographies on my phone. Um, um, so let's get this up. There we go. Um, so we have um, five speakers who are going to be joining us in order to give their sense, you know, in order to share views about public access. We're going to start with a little bit of context, which is always valuable, um, from Maria Garrido and Matias Santano. And Maria is a principal research scientist at the Technology and Social Change Group at the University of Washington in Seattle. And her research areas focus on gender digital equality and the future of employability skills for youth. Uh, Matias Centeno is a social researcher and lecturer at the National University of San Luis, as well as the head of the Rural Extension Agency in San Luis for Inter. And his areas of expertise include family agriculture, digital transformation, and youth studies. And they're going to be talking about a wider context of access to information, which I think is particularly important when we're talking about meaningful connectivity as opposed to just connectivity, the possibility to connect. Um, I'll introduce the others so then we can go straight through. Um, we're then joined by Dr. Ukne Lepikaite, who is an expert with over 15 years of career experience dedicated to the development of impact evaluation methodologies and tools for assessing the outcomes of public library services. And her work includes numerous research projects focused on measuring the impact of public internet access in libraries, and the critical role libraries play in providing connectivity and digital skills to communities. In addition to the research, she's developed a number of training programs and conducted training for public and community librarians in Africa, enabling them to assess community needs and evaluate the transformative impact of library services. Then we'll have Wawa Titi Hayanti, who is a senior librarian at the National Library of Indonesia. She holds a master's from Sheffield University and has been working at the National Library of Indonesia for over 30 years. Previous to this, she was in charge of the Library Training Center and the Library and Information Services Center, where she assisted in the development of capabilities of librarians and library technicians all over Indonesia. Today, she's still an active member in the Indonesian Library Association and the Library Forums for all types of libraries. And finally, we will have Don Means. And Don has over 25 years of experience in the IT industry. And he's a co-founder and principal of Digital Village Associates, a consulting firm founded in 94 that focuses on information and communications technologies as transformational tools and subjects for local communities. Um, Ten years ago, Means founded Don founded the Gigabit Libraries Network, which is an open collaboration of innovative libraries cooperating as a dis distributed testbed and showcase environment for high performance applications and equipment in the service of educational, civic, and cultural objectives. The Gigabit Libraries Network has created the Libraries White Space Project in 2015 to explore how integrating unlicensed open wireless communication technologies can benefit library users by combining the near universal compatibility of Wi Fi with the range and penetrating capabilities of white space devices. And this is not the last technology that Don has engaged with that I know we'll hear about. So with that, I will hand over to Maria and Matthias in order to give us some of the context about access to information and what that means today. Um. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much, Stephen, and for the invitation to share this um, panel. And um, I'd like to start, thank you for initiating the presentation. So as Stephen mentioned, this is um, the context in terms of the progress that we've made in the past seven years. You know, uh, the UN 2030 Agenda celebrates Midway um, in 2023. So what is the progress that regions of the world have made towards uh, um, inclusive connectivity and meaningful access to information? Next, please. 
Um, this is part of an initiative called uh, DA2I, Development and Access to Information, um, a joint initiative between IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, and the University of Washington, and has three main objectives, demonstrate how meaningful access to information contributes to advancing um, the sustainable development goals, and of course, within that context, demonstrate the contribution of libraries, um, providing e equitable access to information and connectivity in the context of the agenda. Next, please. Um, so it answers a very basic, although very complex question. No? Um, given the unprecedented ability we have today to share, create, and exchange information, how can meaningful connectivity and inclusive access to information um, advance poverty, um, diminish poverty, advance equality, give young people more opportunity, etc.? Next, please. Um, we, it's the rights and capacity, that's the way we define inclusive connectivity and meaningful access to information, the rights and capacity to use, create, and share information in ways that are meaningful to each individual, community, organization. Um, we have three different dimensions, connectivity, gender equity, and freedom. 29 indicators, um, public, publicly available indicators, mostly through the UN, um, UN agencies, the World Bank, and for Freedom, Freedom House. So we're going to tell you, we're going to walk you through these three dimensions um, to let you know and then, you know, share with you um, the progress that we've made in the past seven years since the UN 23 agenda began, 2015. As I said, it's midway through the agenda, so let's see the progress of regions and countries. I'll hand out to you, Matthias, for connectivity. Okay, the first pillar of the triangle of aspects, of three aspects that consider, are considered in the meaningful access to information research that we conduct shows, the next please, show more people and more houses connected to internet. If we saw, if we saw the progress in connectivity between 20, 15 and 2022, the next, we can see that today uh, the 60% of the world's population are internet users, which means an increase of 20% from seven years ago, but this access has uh, asymmetric impacts. I mean, uh, if we saw, for example, uh, from the economic side, the low-income countries exceed a 30% of uh, people connected uh, against to the high-income uh, high countries. Uh, when, when in this, uh, this came of countries, the percentage uh, increased to the 90%. So, uh, however, we have more people connected. Uh, the next. However, this progress, uh, this progress is more slower than expected if we take the United Nations Connected 2030 Agenda as a compass. We can see here in this slide the internet population growth by regions. Uh, the, 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 the goal is to 70% uh, of individuals worldwide using the internet, and today we have only five regions managed to reach the goal. The next, please. According to our research in 2022, the world is, is still behind in achievement the target 1.2 and 1.1. And the next, this is the case of households when uh, we can see that the situation is the same. Maria, the next. Thank you. So this is important context to um, uh, support of public access and support of the role of public libraries, libraries in general. Um, it's still not only incredibly relevant, but it's necessary. In terms of gender equity, next please. Unfortunately, um, the progress was not as great as connectivity. We have very marginal progress uh, towards gender equity. We have more women using the internet, 52% of women in the world. There's still 208 uh, uh, more men than 208 million more men than women uh, connected. And uh, you see that in the other three indicators, uh, very marginal progress. Could you go to the next, please? Um, the gender inequality index had a very marginal drop, um, which is almost, you know, unseeming, um, but it's declining, but very, very marginally. Next, please. 
um, in terms of gender digital divide, again, we are behind the Connect 2030 2.8 target by 2030 gender equality. We're still behind, and this is the world average. Of course, this does not uh, um, um, show the difference in regions, but if you see on the left side, in low-income countries, four out of five women are still offline. Next, please. If you look at the regions, um, the only region that has achieved gender digital equality is Latin America with more women than men connected. And Northern Africa and Southern East Africa were the two regions that made more progress in the past seven years, connecting both more men and also more women. Next, please. Unfortunately, women continue to be three times or two times as likely to be not in employment, education, or training compared to men. And in Southern Asia and Western Asia, young women are three times as likely. So still, the opportunity, even though we're more connected, um, the opportunities for women are still less than for men in many regions of the world. Next, please. Similar with women in science and women in politics. We have a marginal progress of 1% for women in science to 37%. And that's a difficult indicator because we really don't know what exactly are they doing, what positions are they advancing in science, especially in the creation of knowledge and the designing of technology, and 22% in politics. Next, please. Okay, in terms that freedom, we don't have the good news also, so sorry. <laughs> I'd look, uh, if we had a, a look at the progress between 2015 and 2022 shows a decline in all freedoms indicators. Next. We can see, uh, we, we measure the progress according to freedom aggregated scores, civil rights, political rights, and freedom on the net index in all of these uh, indicators we have decreasing between two and seven points. Next. So more digital access has not mean an improvement in the levels of participation and also democratic development of our society. We have seen right now in the, in the, in the screen that uh, uh, evolution and progress between 2015 and 2022 except that uh, an increase of number of countries that are declining freedom scores, which, uh, 71, seven years ago, to 120 uh, the, the last year. So civil rights and political freedoms have declining across all regions. And when I say all regions, uh, regardless their economic uh, development, as we can see in the screen, we the, 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 the worst situation are in developing regions. 32 countries of developing regions uh, decline freedom scores, uh, followed by the Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Next. Internet freedom declined for 12 consecutive years. 12 consecutive year we have mm, uh, bad, bad indicators uh, related to, to freedom. So. Uh, we are increasingly digital, but less and less free and subject to rights. This trend confirmed that more digital infrastructure don't need don't not lead necessarily to an improvement in uh, quality of life or uh, better so uh, societies or better quality of lives. Ne next, he uh, we can see the freedom on the net. Uh, in measure of losses and gains by regions, uh, the, the, this remark, the, the relevance to qualify the gap, the digital gap, uh, go beyond of uh, infrastructure access. Because we, if, if we saw only the digital access penetration, we are losing some part of the history. I mean, uh, this shows some pending matters we saw in terms of gender, in terms of freedom, uh, but also in terms of uh, rural and urban uh, divide, for example. In my country, in Argentina, the National Institute of Agriculture Technology measured that, that today, 30% of rural towns uh, don't have access to internet, but 80% of people living there had bad connections, so they can't um, enjoy the, the, the rights of digital life today. Next, please. So one of the elements that we like to highlight is the very uh, scarcity of data. So all the analysis that we brought to you today, although it's from 2022, 
it was released on 2022. Many of the countries do not have data um, that is recent or that shows the impact of the pandemic and the dynamics of the pandemic in the world. So uh, we don't only need more data, we need better data, right? Better data that reflects the realities of communities um, and reflects the, the, the why connectivity is important, why inclusive connectivity should be promoted and addressed, and of course, in the context of public access. Next, please. So as I said, limited or no data, of course, gender disaggregated, binary, there's limited, and gender, uh, uh, different gender dissidents or gender fluid identities, there's all, like nothing available. Next, please. Um, so just quickly to wrap up, only 86 countries in the world collect internet population by sex, um, not gender, sex. Um, of these, only 60 have historical data, so it's very difficult to assess progress in terms of uh, uh, gender digital equity, and even fewer countries have you know, um, um, data on digital divide by other intersectional factors, age, locality, ed education, etc. Limited data on digital skills, of course, um, no data on types of use, motivations, and impact of this connectivity uh, in everyday life, and of course, no data on online violence and harassment that, as we know, affects particularly women and, and um, members of the LGBTQ plus communities. Next. So the road ahead, what it will take to guarantee inclusive connectivity and meaningful access to all information to all people, and what is the role of public access and of course of libraries in addressing the roots of inequality, not only public access in terms of connecting people to the internet, but the roots of inequality. And with this, we end. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. And very good. Th 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 thank you very much, and I think that's, you know, it, it's powerful, I think, the thing that for me that underlines is, is that we have seen a sort of decoupling between connectivity and meaningful connectivity mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and that that word meaningful is so important because despite the good results when it comes to connectivity as a whole, it's not feeding through mm -hmm. into other things and, and I don't know, that should be a, a bit of an alarm call that in a place like this where you know, we shouldn't be measuring the success of the internet in terms of the number of people connected. We should be measuring it in terms of the positive change that it brings about, and that's just not happening right now. Right. So <coughs> I think there's that, and I think that this is obviously one a, a thing that hopefully can be taken away from the IGF in general, just the need to invest in data collection. And that's something that, I don't know, it's kind of crazy that we're talking about governance. Um, we aren't really talking as anywhere near enough about the evidence on which governance decisions might actually be made rather than just sort of superstition and, and yep. Thank That's you, Stephen. And just one second, we forgot uh, to show the part of the, the, the initiative. We developed the, these dashboards. You have the QR code on your screen if you would like to explore um, as an example today of the analysis that you can do um, with our visualization tool. Thank you very much. So I definitely recommend take a look. It's a fantastic resource. It really is. Um, and allowing you to look across different se sections and different questions is really, really powerful. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Ugne, who is joining us from yesterday because she's in Chile. So um, It's already past midnight, so now I am also... Oh, you're also on also today. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, um, okay, so w welcome to today, Ugne. <laughs> so I'm going to hand you. over. Thank you so much. Okay, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will just try to share my screen yeah. because yep. as, uh, as everyone, you know, you make last minute changes in your slides. So, so I have an, a newer version of my slides. So we we uh, sympathize entirely. <laughs> All right. So good morning, everyone. Um, in Kyoto and also online. Uh, really thrilled to participate in the session. Uh, thank you to my colleagues from Washington, University of Washington for amazing presentation. Um, and uh, I will be speaking today um, about role of public access through two, two examples. And um, these two examples actually uh, illustrate what colleagues just showed on the screen so these graphs where there are big differences between developed countries and, for example, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So two examples that I chose are Canada and Uganda. And I will be showing the role of uh, public access 
through the lens of these two countries and uh, presenting evidence how public access in these countries uh, is filling gaps of connectivity and also addressing most pressing needs of, of communities in these countries. For Uganda case, it's our, uh, our study. We did it in, uh, earlier this year. Uh, for Canada, I just used publicly available data and research, and I will give you the references at the end of my presentation. So let me start by just giving you a very brief uh, overview of both countries. So naturally, in Canada has strong internet infrastructure with over 90% of people having uh, high-speed uh, internet access at home, um, even in remote areas. However, I think it is important to emphasize that uh, it is not true that in Canada, digital divide is non-existent. Uh, if you look a bit deeper and for instance, among low income populations, uh, more than half of them uh, lack access at home and mainly it's uh, an issue of affordability. Uh, Canada has extensive network of public libraries, over 3,000 of them providing all sorts of uh, resources in all sorts of formats, including uh, obviously access to computers, internet, and digital skills training. Now, when you look in, at, at Uganda, uh, over recent years, internet penetration in Uganda has been growing as well. But if we talk about home connectivity, it's still heavily lacking behind. And there is a very big uh, um, uh, rural and urban divide, as well as big gender disparities. Uh, Uganda has 45 public libraries funded by government. About half of them are connected to uh, computers and internet. And uh, they have also a very vibrant uh, network of community libraries, uh, around 100 of them, but very few are connected to the internet. So let's see how, how public access looks at, at, at both countries. First of all, who are the users of, of public access? In Canada, almost half of public access users fall below the age of 35. Uh, notably, public libraries in Canada demonstrate really high utilization uh, by vulnerable populations. So if we look at statistics for uh, low income individuals, immigrants, visible minorities, people over 55 years of age, uh, they are really uh, big users of public access. Uh, now, what is really striking uh, me is that over half of public access users in Canada don't have alternative place to access internet. That, that is a statistic that surprised me, actually. Um, in Uganda, you know, it's a very young society, so almost 80% of users fall between the age of 15 and 25. And again, we see a really big use by vulnerable populations. So you remember... I mentioned gender divide, so 56% of users are female, so it's a big contribution to, uh, to gender inclusion in Uganda, uh, as well as 22% coming from rural, rural areas. Again, it is a very important figure in terms of urban and uh, rural divide. Uh, again, really high number of people, over 70%, who have no alternative place to access internet. Now, when I started to look about uh, into patterns of use of public access, uh, I was again quite surprised because I found striking similarities and communication and education seem to be dominant areas of focus, both in Canada and Uganda. Uh, for communications, uh, uh, in individuals mainly use online tools, social media to connect uh, with friends, family, uh, educational activities thrive in Uganda, uh, especially over the last few years, where people seek study-related information, they take online courses, engage with video tutorials, webinars, educators via Zoom, Teams, Google, Google Classroom, and so on. Um, in Canada, it's quite similar. Uh, most popular educational activities include completing uh, coursework, taking online courses, workshops, um, and so on. Now, employment-related activities is the next area, which is, again, really popular in, in both countries, especially in Uganda, where people look for jobs, uh, fill in their CVs, and uh, use public access for skills enhancement. Um, concerning e-government, again, 
very similar usage patterns uh, in Canada, people looking for government programs, subsidies, uh, in Uganda, uh, looking for forms for applying uh, for different, uh, different programs online. And lastly, for business related activities uh, in both countries, again, we have very similar percentages uh, of people who are looking for information to start businesses, uh, to maintain existing businesses and so on. Uh, and in Uganda, what was very popular is uh, people looking uh, ways to deploy online tools to promote their services or to sell their services or, or their products online. Now I'm getting to, I think, the most important part of my presentations uh, where I would like to highlight key outcomes arising from uh, the use of public access in both countries. And first one, without uh, much doubt, is uh, related to digital literacy. Um, in Canada, digital skills training programs in libraries are uh, widespread, and they range from basic use of internet and email to quite sophisticated courses on web design and programming, as well as one-on-one -on -one, uh, support and consultations. And um, Canadian studies show that over 80% of users report increased confidence and comfort uh, in using technologies as a result of public access uh, use and training programs. Also, about a half of them report that uh, in public access venue in the library, they were first introduced to a new technology. In Uganda, over the last two years, we, we have been implementing a digital skills uh, program in 27 libraries. And these libraries trained over 22,000 people to use computers and internet. Uh, and we served those people and 94% of them credit library for Im improved digital skills. Uh, many of them became continuous uh, internet users in the library. And when we went back to them and asked again, uh, they said that two thirds uh, continued to use librarian as an advisor when, when they need help to use technology. Another area, very important area of outcomes is related to education. As I mentioned before, education is, is a big part of activities uh, are related to education. Um, and uh, for Canada, I found statistics that 45% uh, of users report that through public access, they managed to uh, develop employable skills. And in UK, Uganda, over 85% of people saw improvement of their ac academic results, and 78 uh, report that they managed to develop vocational skills, which are aimed at uh, generating income. Uh, another area that I analyzed uh, was community, social, and civic engagement. And uh, it is not a mistake, it is the same percentage for both countries, it's a, maybe a coincidence. So uh, in Canada, 81% of public access users experience some kind of increase in the level of social engagement uh, through participation and learning about uh, local groups, volunteering opportunities, issues of local politics and so on. And in Uganda, the same percentage of users says that library improved their social linkages uh, almost 70% became more active in society by learning about local issues and contacting local authorities. Uh, the last area that I analyzed is related to entrepreneurship, workforce, and business development. Uh, so uh, again, the statistics that, that uh, I could find uh, showed that 26% of uh, Canadians uh, report that they used public access to manage existing business, uh, conduct business related search or start new business. Uh, a lot of people come uh, to learn job seeking skills and nearly half of them successfully managed to get jobs afterwards. Uh, in Uganda, situation is quite similar. We see very similar percentages of people who uh, used public access to earn some additional income as well as uh, improved uh, their work performance, as well as, as many people finding jobs. Um, the studies that I analyzed provide so much data and evidence about positive effects of, of public access, and I, I could continue along these lines. 
but I will stop here and try to emphasize what uh, these percentages mean to me and how I interpret them. So first of all, uh, also to confirm what Stephen uh, said in his introduction, uh, public access continues to be relevant uh, um, regardless of whether individuals have internet access at home. Uh, in both Canada and Uganda, the importance of providing access to information, to technology, to digital resources in public spaces uh, cannot be underestimated. Um, secondly, major outcomes uh, of public access in both countries uh, revolve uh, around fostering digital inclusion and promoting equality. And, and these initiatives really show um, effectiveness and positive impact in, in breaking down barriers that prevent uh, certain groups of, uh, of people uh, enjoying benefits of digital age. Um, thirdly, beyond digital inclusion and equity, uh, public access in libraries deliver a wide range of secondary benefits. Uh, these uh, encompass meaningful education, uh, encouraging civic participation, engaging citizens in community initiatives, um, promoting social participation, allowing them to share with each other, engaging in, in online communities and so on. And lastly, public access in libraries uh, make significant contribution to uh, livelihood gains. Uh, so expands opportunities for online job seeking, skills development, uh, entrepreneurship and so on. So to wrap up, uh, I could say that public access uh, in both Canada and Uganda serves as powerful catalyst uh, for the growth of individuals, for the growth of societies. Um, and, and this is really uh, an, an, an evidence that we can put on the table to show that uh, not only libraries not only provide access to technologies, but also ser serve as catalysts for uh, empowerment, education, social and economic advancement, and really contribute to more inclusive and equitable future for, 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 for everyone. Uh, and this is what I had today for you. And these are the references that I promised. Those uh, first two studies are linked to the data that I uh, mentioned uh, about Canada and the remaining two are about Uganda. So if you are interested to look deeper, you're welcome to check these out. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ugnen. I might actually ask if you can include those links in the chat so that people can can click on them. But sure. I think that, 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 that's fantastic. I think <coughs> I think the, the comparison between Uganda and, and Canada is really good because it underlines firstly that this is a, a relevant concept around the world. It's not something that's just for one subgroup, it's not for one country, it's not for one continent, that it's got that relevance everywhere. And I think all those examples of the different dimensions, the different ways in which, the different areas in which public access makes a difference is, is powerful. I'm sure you know, plenty of these will not have been foreseen, they will not have been imagined 20 years ago, and yet it's happening now. It is, I know, public access is giving rise to, it's making possible to make these sorts of changes. So. That's, that's really fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Waro, um, who's going to talk from the Indonesian perspective. Thank you, Stephen. Yes. Uh, can I have the slide on? Yeah. Here, we can start with the second slide. Okay. Uh, since, 90, uh, since 2011, actually, that the, uh, in we start to transform in managing the library, especially those in the village or remote areas by providing them with internet access. And the transformation has made that the library has become the place to learn from the printed or digital materials, can be also audio, video materials as well. And then also this is the library become the place to share, to share, the co uh, to share knowledge amongst the community itself, and then also it's the place to do activities, play music, also play, uh, creativity with handicrafts, and then make products, make uh, cookies, and also discussion about uh, other things. And this one of the, 
this can is can see that this is the products that the village library has made and they learn this also from the internet and also from their colleagues in the village and this actually the transformation to empower the community and to preserve the local content and all of those things is to increase the community engagement and also to increase the community prosperity this can be reached faster if the library is provided by internet access. Can we go to this next uh, slide, please? Yeah, this is, uh, just want to show you that this is the uh, fact that how big we are in here, that the population is 275 million, and the land area, you can see that, and the district, uh, we have the 34, province and the district is five, uh, 514 and the villages we have is 80,820. And the schools, you can imagine that we have a lot of schools, elementary school itself that 174,373, uh, uh, senior high is 58,800, senior high is 36,000, and university is 3,994. Next please. Yes, uh, that is another, uh, this is the, what the picture of the librarian, Stephen. There's a library that we have, this is mixed between the librarian, professional librarian and the technicals, 10,000. And the total number, libraries in Indonesia is uh, 164,610. And the provincial public libraries is 34 because in each pub, uh, province we have one public libraries and district libraries, uh, part of the 514, we only have that four 496 libraries. And sub-district libraries, we have 1,685. Village library, sorry, village library is, uh, hang on, that is elementary school, sorry, yeah? And then that is 33 something, uh, 33,000. And the school, uh, elementary schools, oh, sorry, village library 33,000, that is recorded. And then school library, elementary school library is 76,000. Uh, 76, and junior high school library is 19,900 something. Senior high school library is 17,000 something. And university is 2,557. Uh, Special uh, special uh, libraries at this government, uh, that is 2,202. Special and private libraries is 872. Islamic boarding library is 3,478. And school library community is 1,000 something. And then the community reading garden, it's in a garden, it's a park actually, that's 5,928. That is the uh, total of the all together is one uh, one thousand sixty four uh, one hundred sixty four thousand six hundred ten and ten thousand of it is being accredited and then not yet accredited is one hundred and fifty four thousands. Next, please. Yes. Here is the National Library as the national advocate all the types of libraries in Indonesia. We advocate them with trainings, coaching, mentoring, grant, and funding. One of the privilege of the National Library of Indonesia is that it is non-ministry governmental institution which directly under the president. The National Library of Indonesia in is under the coordination of the Ministry of Education and Culture, but we responsibility directly to the president. So this gives us uh, the the more power to decide to to do to do to establish the national li uh, the, the library system in Indonesia that we are not depending from other ministerial no but we can do that ourselves that's why we can uh, publish the we can uh, establish the accreditation we can also the standardization of the libraries okay next please yes uh, this is the uh, the policy in here, the rules of the function of National Library. Yes, this is uh, uh, as other libraries. Yeah, this is the the first is library uh, as the library development center that no one has this uh, functions because with this we can give advocation to the public 
uh, uh, other libraries, and also we can, um, uh, what is it? We can help them. We can develop them. Yeah, those the six one hundred and sixty four thousands. We have we can we have to help them to to develop. And then this is for the reference library and depository center, research center. I think this is almost the same with other libraries. Next, please. Yeah, this is the obligations of the National Library. That is, this is number one, to so develop library national system in supporting the national education system. We have a on, uh, quote unquote, that is we are very powerful in the field of libraries in here. The guarantee and sustainability of the libraries, the community learning center, guarantee availability of the library services, and also the guarantee of the availability collection through translation, transliteration, transcription, and transmedia. And also because of the reading habits not too high yet, that we have to promote the reading habit and library services and develop library collection and also we have to also develop ourselves and to also to appreciate the preserved manuscript. Yes, please, next. Yes, another click. I think that is for the library transformation by expanding. Yeah, yeah, next, please. Also. This is yesterday, I mentioned that the, the directive, uh, that's the first, uh, no? Okay, sorry. Yes, uh, that is the policy that we have to make. That is the problems, actually. We have that three. We have to make it actions in here. Yeah, there's a problem, connectivity, content, and human resources. That's the problem that we have to face. The connectivity, judging from the huge area that we have, and then that is the, we have to do it now. The, the how to uh, uh, encounter with that problems. And we cannot go to the one place directly, so what we have to do, that we have to provide them with the internet access. And then also with the uh, content, that is also difficult to get uh, to uh, produce the co digital contents. So uh, physical contents that we cannot distribute all over because it's too far. So we, we cre have to create the digital contents. And we also uh, provoke actually the local government to create also the local digital contents so we can share with each other. Next, please. Yeah. And yeah, this is the, the presidential directive that we have to do this. Uh, we said that the president said that improve and expand access to the digital libraries in order to accelerate the human resource development who will master science and technology, improve creativity and innovation to create job opportunities. That is job opportunities, reduce unemployment rate and increase income for per capita as well as increase foreign exchange to create prosperity. Okay, next please. Yeah. yeah, this is talking about the uh, internet access in Indonesia. Yeah, it's quite big. In 2023, that those who have the access of internet is uh, 215,626,166 million, that is out of our populations. It means that is 78.19% of the total populations. And then for the uh, gender, yes, the penetration is 70%, uh, 79.32%, 70, uh, and the contribution is only 51%. And then for women, se uh, the penetration is 77%, and the contribution is 48.8%. And then your urban areas, that is the penetration is 87.55%, uh, uh, and the contribution is 64.57%. And rural area, that this penetration is 79.79% and the contribution is only 35.43. This is what we are we are going to push the, to what is it to make it people more give in contribution in the rural area. Next please. Yes. This is the occupation for the penetration for the uh, students and college that is 90.8% uh, almost 100% in here, but the contribution is only 16%. And then for the housewives, 
77.8%, uh, the contribution is only 1985%. And the, for the workers, that is quite big, that is 84.70%, 72%, the contribution is 60%, 0 0.3, 32. And then for the teachers' retirement, and then for the government uh, officers, is 71.84%, uh, and the contributions is not too much. It's only 0.062%. And then for the unemployment, 72%, they access internet quite a lot, but the contribution is only 3.11%. We get that, that this from the uh, Association of the Internet Provider in Indonesia. And then the incomes, the child, for from the incomes, we have that in, uh, uh, let's see, one US dollar is equal to 15,500 15, rupiahs. So this those who whose income is under 1 million is 76. 99% and then for those who is uh, what is it for those who has the the above uh, 15 millions it's almost 100% contribution yeah and then again the contribution is only 0.18% and then for the uh, those who 5 millions up to 15 millions that's 95.62% and the contribution is 876% and this, uh, what we see from the, the, the internet that we have the data. And then next, please. Yeah, the main reason for using the internet is finding information. That's quite big, yeah, it's uh, about 60%, uh, 80%, yeah? That is 80% per uh, percent, sorry. And then this is for the, after that, the finding new ideas and inspiration and the rest, okay. Uh, next, please. Yes, please. Expanding connectivity. Yes, this is what we have in libraries. It's not yet fully integrated. Yesterday, also I mentioned this into the national data infrastructure because uh, the president directly said that we have to have to create the data center, the national data center, and this uh, national library of one part of the 65 ministries and councils uh, in Indonesia that we have the obligation also to provide. Our data, the, the public, uh, the data. There are two, two pu there's the public uh, services, and then the other one is for the administrative. That is for the internal use. The public that is for uh, uh, given to public. It, that is we have the in this slide. We also have the one search, Indonesian one search, and also ePusnas. Next, please. Okay, this is an example of the Indonesian knowledge discovery. Yesterday I also mentioned, this is Indonesian One Search. That is a single search portal for the all public collection from libraries, museum, and archive all over Indonesia. It is used as union catalog, and it also provides access to international electric resources. It's sus subscribed by the National Library and, uh, and for all registered members. Yeah, that is for the uh, what is it? The e-resources should be a registered members, but for the Indonesian one search itself, it's not registered. Just you can just uh, comes and go in the purposenas.go.id. Next, please. Yeah, this is the uh, contributors, and this is the the members of the uh, Indonesian one search. You can see the number; it's quite big. Next, please. Yes. Yes, this is in the slide. This is that. The latest is in this, in this slide 3.2 is the latest version of the library automation software developed by the National Library of Indonesia, and this is given free to those uh, the library library in Indonesia to use it. And this why we put it in the Indonesia uh, uh, National Data Center to be par to become part of the public services that can be used for everybody. Next, please. Yeah. Next, please. This is uh, this. this Next, yeah, this is e-mobile, yes. E-mobile, we have the e -pusnas. This is for the, uh, sorry, this is the uh, e-mobile for the social media base for e -pusnas. yes. And this in here, just like yesterday I mentioned, we have the e-donations, uh, e that if you write books and then you want to donate your books, uh, we don't want to talk about the royalty, let's forget about the royalty, but just put it, your book there and we will pub, uh, uh, publish it, yeah, and then uh, a digital, and then uh, people can access to that books, yeah. 
uh, because mostly that, let's say, uh, governors, they like to write books and then say, okay, I just want to write this, and people will sh uh, uh, wants to know what I've done so far, this is my achievement, and I think this is, the, we put it there. And uh, they don't want to sell their books, actually. They just write the books for their achievement that, I mean, what is it, that's uh, self-esteem or, so, uh, yeah. This, this is what I have done so far. This is what I do. A part of that, that this people should know. Should people should read for this book, my my books. Okay, next please. Yes, this is our new. This is uh, Bintang Pursnas. This is uh, we also, This is for the only for university and schools. We work together with the uh, Minister of Religion because uh, School of Religions is under the Minister of Religion and. And the general school is under the Minister of Education. The total collection, the digital collection, is that one million four uh, four hundred eighty eight uh, forty eight thousand and seventy four hundred seventy uh, thousand books. Yes, this can be accessible. Yeah, it's a, have a live chat and video as well. Next, please. Yeah. Okay. This is the e-resources. I think that's everybody. Also, the same with other library, national library, they have the uh, A resources that, uh, what is it, can be accessed for everybody. Yes, next, please. Yeah, this is another, yes, please. Ah, this one. Uh, part of that, the the uh, digital things, we also have the, to, to make the, uh, the, what is it, the, the collection co information close to the uh, people in the remote areas or in the uh, city, actually. We distribute about uh, f 520, uh, uh, n uh, 938 units mobile uh, libraries, yeah, for the 520 locus, and we provide also books, yeah, that is 90,075, uh, 70, uh, yeah, 70, uh, 750 titles, books, sorry, yeah, and then this is also for the mot uh, mobile uh, motorcycle. Yeah, we also give them uh, for the uh, we have the ni nine eight six units, and also we provide with pochadi. Pochadi it means is pojok baca digital. It is the digital corner readings. Yeah, it provides also with digital books, and the latest one is actually. Uh, the National Library one is the Titik Baca. Yeah, it's also uh, provided with the digital uh, contents that can be accessed by people. Next, please. Yeah. This is more collections. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually we give books and for the others and also the, the, the those who receive our uh, grant and our, uh, what is it, uh, collections yes next please yes next please yeah yes this is what yes this property library transforms for what the prosperity please thank you yes next please yes this actually is for the uh, what we do for the the become one of the national uh, priority in the national uh, the the program library transformation for the uh, based on the uh, based on the uh, inclusions, inclusion-based um, uh, libraries. And this is what we developed so far with the, the uh, with our own money here, because before that, actually, we got grant from the Bill and Mindy Get Foundations, it's 2011 up to 2018, but now starting 2018 up to 2023 with our, uh, uh, our own budget and develop more and more uh, libraries to get. Yes, next please. Yes, this is actually the library. I said that is to empower the community to become a place for learning, a place for empowering com a community, a place to share knowledge and also a place to preserve their local uh, culture and enhance also their local culture to be exposed to the people and also this is to empowering people, the um, community. Next, please. Yes, uh, finish. Yeah. Just to give Dom time to speak after okay, you. Okay, okay, okay. Finish then. Okay, that is. Okay, we can skip this. And actually, that is. Uh, next, please. Next. So next, please. Sorry. This is not that good. Yeah. This one is the what they got. And then this is the next samples in great collections. And I think that's all. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you very much. And sorry for cutting you off there, but I think, I think first of all, just as a response almost to what Maria and Matthias were saying, the, the volume of data there is, is really powerful, especially the disaggregated stuff. That's excellent. And just, I don't know, all of that effort and, and all of that work to localize and, and proving, I don't know, public access as a way of localizing efforts to actually provide meaningful connectivity is powerful. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dom. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and thank you all. I, I, I don't have any slides. I'll relieve you of that. And, and I, don't, I don't actually, I'm not going to present any data today because I think we have uh, seen an extraordinary amount, uh, amount of data from uh, our colleagues at the University of Washington and from uh, Eiffel and from the National Library of Indonesia. Uh, I, I just wanted to touch on some conceptual points related to the roles of libraries and how they may be changing or have changed in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, to us, it doesn't seem like the roles have changed so much. It's the circumstances have changed tremendously. Uh, we, I come at this from, as Stephen mentioned, a, a technology background, and most of our work has dealt with uh, uh, technology-related issues, uh, more specifically in communications technology. Uh, we, and I need to update the website because we've been doing this since we started the Gigabit Libraries Network in 2007 with the uh, Fiber to the Library campaign. In the U.S., we said that the most expedient, uh, the most uh, inexpensive, and the most effective way to deliver next generation broadband into every community is to run fiber to all 17,000 public facilities in the U.S. And we've worked on that advocacy campaign since then. We have expanded into wireless, of course, because the world has expanded into wireless. We identified, at that time, we identified three roles for libraries, uh, technology-related roles that we've continued to work on. And the roles, as I say, are still there. The circumstances have changed. Uh, the first one is uh, the library is an early adopter of information technologies. And this, of course, is not a new role. Uh, books themselves represent uh, an early information technology that libraries have led in. Uh, but it's just progressed on from there. So uh, jumping ahead to the arrival of the World Wide Web in the mid-'90s, uh, uh, we were all doing dial-up, maybe. Some of you are here, been around long enough to remember that. Uh, and, and broadband, the, the always-on service was arriving at that time, and people were going, well, what are you talking about? You're comparing straws to fire hoses, and you're telling me about bit rates. I, it doesn't mean anything to me. They go to a library, and they sit down, and they're connected to streaming media, through the internet, you know, like their radio station, their hometown across country. I'm, I'm talking about the big 90s here. And they go, wow, that, that's really cool. I want that at home. And that example, and there are more, of course, uh, is how libraries have introduced emerging technologies to their communities as a, as a showcase environment, as a demo site. And this is, a, this is such a powerful thing because describing technologies in any kind of meaningful way is extremely difficult without direct experience. And that's what libraries provide, is direct experience to that. Uh, they've also played the role, uh, we say, as the human face of e-government. So this has been an explosive area since, well, since 2000, that uh, every agency at every level of government has been automating uh, services for the same, you know, for the typical reasons. It's, it's efficient, it's convenient, it saves money. Well, great, uh, but who, who are those? <laughs> and as they do that, they find new things you can't do with paper. It starts out automating a paper process and they do things you just do with software. Well, and you ask them, okay, that's great, but 
those are just for the people that are connected, right? And they go, well, well, yeah, of course. Well, what about all the people who are not connected? And they go, oh, well, yeah. Uh, well, they can go to the library. They'll help you. Well, yeah, okay, they will. Uh, did you ask them to help? No, we just know they will. And so, okay, are you sa sharing any of your savings with the library to take on this support role that you've given them without them asking for it? Well, no. Well, why not? Well, we don't have to. Okay, great. Thanks again. Uh, but yet it's important because these are daunting applications. They don't work alike. They don't look alike. And even if you have a connection, they can be difficult to navigate. But the librarians are the ideal people to confer with in the development of these programs. They have more experience in what it's like for people to use these programs than anybody else. They need to be drawn into the development phase of, of uh, government applications, we, 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 another drum that we beat. Uh, the third role that we've focused on is as uh, so-called second responders. The, in large-scale events, the first responders, the, the police, the ambulances, the firemen, are completely overwhelmed in large-scale events. And then everybody is on their own at that point. Well, they turn to public facilities like schools and, and libraries as places to get help, to get communication, to get information about what's going on, as uh, common distribution points for, for supplies and those kinds of uh, events. And so we, we refer to these as second responders that have a special category and need to be accommodated with communication technology that's resilient to these outages, which is a general condition that doesn't necessarily represent the presence of a, a large-scale disaster, like an extreme weather event that knocks out the telecommunications infrastructure. When it does, these systems are out for days, weeks, or longer. Uh, we just went, to, I, I live in uh, uh, a county just north of San Francisco, and about four or five years ago, suddenly the lights went out. There was no disaster, well, at least not where we were, but the utility company had turned off the electricity in the county to all quarter of a million people living there to support the needs further north where we're having these fires. And it's really interesting, if, you, if you've not been through an outage longer than an hour or two, what happens after about 24 hours? You start wondering what you've got in the freezer <laughs> and you wonder how, how, what you're gonna, you know, your phone is gonna do because your, your internet, your Wi-Fi is out and your phone battery is dying and you really don't have any other source of information about what's going on. So you have to go somewhere and so people did. They went to a community center in every town, the library in my own town, and it was filled with people uh, daisy chained on surge suppressors, recharging their phones and using the uh, resilient uh, internet access to the library, which was a fiber connection. And that was a real eye opener that that really wasn't planned, but it was just the way people respond to need. They just figure it out. When the Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, everything was wiped out. And people just went to the nearest library, even though they didn't have a connection, people just went there and then they started setting up Wi-Fi routers just to allow people to communicate with each other. It's just what people figure out in these, in, in these situations. The, the challenge of the topic here of roles for libraries is that the library plays so many roles. We've, we've started referring to libraries as the Swiss army knife of public institutions. They provide more different services to more people than any other institution by far. And it makes it a challenge for them because it's not the best corkscrew and it's not the best knife and it's not the best uh, bottle opener, but it's all of those things in one place. And that's a hard case to make for something special, but they are special because they do so much for so many. And, uh, and, and, and I wanna touch again on this uh, point about uh, uh, the response in crisis, and, I, and I'll kind of close with that, that it's, it's increasingly common for communities to experience these extreme weather events. This is climate-driven extreme weather, whether it's inundated with rains or no rain at all or extreme high winds. All of these weather phenomena are being accelerated by the heating of the atmosphere. And 
this conversation is really, we would say, supersedes all other issues. I mean, every day we have to do something today, and that's, that's normal, but in the larger picture, this is our number one challenge. And libraries are there. What can they do about this? Well, like each of us, not very much in terms of mitigating a circumstance that has gone on too far. But they can do something about adaptation because we have, we have surpassed the point where we could fix it or we could reverse it. Uh, maybe we can, we, we have to try, but the effects of it are baked in. We're in for severe weather from here on and these events are gonna be more common and, these, uh, and, and more severe. And so what we all can do at every level is try to adapt. And this is where libraries can uh, play a special role in showing how to do that and, and being resilient. Uh, as I mentioned, we've focused mostly on communication technologies, mostly in wireless for the last 15 years or so, uh, how libraries and other community anchor institutions can connect to each other and create a, uh, an autonomous local community network that can be in touch with itself, even if it doesn't actually have outside uh, connection to the outside world. Uh, but now uh, there is new communication technology, satellite technology from systems in low Earth orbit, which is um, uh, different than the traditional satellite communication, which relies on satellites that are, that are thousands and thousands of kilometers out and the, the response time for the communication is very, very slow and it, it, does, it wouldn't support an event like this. It's just the lag time is too much. These new systems, principally one from Starlink, uh, it, the satellites orbit at under a thousand kilometers and the, uh, the residual time, the, the feedback, the lag is very short. It allows you know, any kind of connectivity, actually is robust uh, 100 megabit type connectivity. The thing that is, this is not just sort of a new wireless scheme perhaps, what it is is a new global wireless network that can connect any point, any point on the planet, can have robust broadband with, in a box, it goes out and, <laughs> and you plug it in, it turns itself on, it, it wiggles around, it announces itself to the overhead satellites. It's got a bundled router and in 10 minutes you have that kind of connection. This is completely new. Now, will it work? Is it affordable? How usable is it? It's, you know, could th the availability is just one of the, the barriers to adoption. Uh, affordability and usability being the two other pr principal uh, uh, needs. But without availability, the other two are moot questions. And, and so libraries are there in their typical way to consolidate a resource for the community and then share it. And so this is something that we're uh, advocating that libraries try out if the service is available there uh, and learn about it and decide if they want to use it. But we are uh, totally sold on the library as the quintessential public institution and they're irreplaceable and they're just marvelous. And I'm, I'm pleased to be here today. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Don, for those for those words. And I think I'm just trying to draw out examples about those trends. I think the point you made, I don't know, the, the original WISIS document talked about multi-purpose. I'm wondering if we need to even talk about polypurpose or something that underlines just how many different roles there are, but also despite the complexity that brings, also the value that it brings, that it's really this one-stop shop, this role of the library is a place where you can localize. And so, I don't know, a internet access is not a one-way thing, and if we only think about technical solutions, then we tend to only think about the supply side, not about the demand side. So that aspect of localizing, applying, actually making the link between the potential and the output is really powerful. So um, w we're into our last five minutes. Um, we've got some people online. Um, if you are still in Mentee, um, we'd obviously welcome any further thoughts or questions you have about um, suggestions and your views about how public access has evolved, or what you think we should be taking into account in subsequent versions of the report from the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access and Libraries. Um, 
I suppose I, I would actually ask other panelists um, if you have any sort of responses or, or, or views, having listened to each other, about you know, themes that you think have come out that, that underline or that and angles that we should be thinking about in trying to assess what those evolutions have been over those last 20 years and why public access is actually as relevant, if not more relevant, than it was back in 20, 2003. I'm going to jump in on that one because I think it's a great question. I'll, I'll try to make it quick, though. Uh, our view is that uh, libraries with robust Internet connection offer the, the minimal accepted baseline for universal access to the Internet. That's what everyone everywhere should have, even if they don't have, you know, fiber of the home and the rest of it. They have a community point where they can they can engage with a digital conversation uh, for no fee or a very low fee. And this is extremely doable. It's nothing like the goal of you know, everybody connected at home, uh, but it's, it's very, uh, very doable with today's technology. What? Yeah, I think I agree with Don that actually this library should be uh, provided with the internet that people can activate their st uh, is because sometimes internet is difficult to get it uh, access internet at homes or not everybody can have the the what is it equipment the tools to access and then they have to come to the libraries and the libraries must be empowered with the 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 access of the internet that is the most important thing that people can do activity can access internet there can talk there and can learn in based on the internet access thank you thank you and, and I know that there's clearly there's, there's work that needs to be done, I think, for the libraries for which we have data, about yeah. two-thirds are connected. But that's only, there's only, we don't have data for so many, so there's another data call. So coming on to the data <laughs> and your response. Um, I think, for, thank you for all the wonderful presentations. One thing that seems to me vital to understand is that in this narrative that in many ways the UN and many governments sponsor that connectivity will solve many social problems, libraries have remained at the heart of helping to resolve those root problems, right? Inequality, um, and access, lack of access to education, lack of access to, to, to um, economic and educational opportunities. And I think that shows that <laughs> as institutions that are fundamental in social social fabric of societies. It doesn't matter how much connectivity we have, apparently I mean we saw the data, connectivity does not, is not solving gender inequality, connectivity is not giving us more freedom. So the, these social institutions are fundamental in that equation. I, I believe that we need to renew the the, the narrative about the digital access, we, we are in a different point of uh, part of the history of the human interactivity with technologies, I mean, AI, social and technical, and social technical presentations. I, I believe that uh, we need to be on uh, the, the digital connectivity and, 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 and think about this second gap related to skills, related to gender, related to diversity, and you're more and more um, uh, ahead w to qualify this uh, in digital access today. Thank you, and uh, I think that's probably going to be one of the key messages we come out of. Um, Ugne, did you want to add a last thing? Yes, just uh, very briefly, I, I'm still thinking about the presentation made by colleagues uh, from the University of Washington, and I think that libraries uh, have done amazing work in bringing people online. They've also contributed significantly uh, to the gender equality, uh, but now I, I was thinking, what else can we do to give more freedom? Because this is where we, we saw, you know, we are doing really badly on these indicators. So I'm uh, not only looking back 20 years, you know, back, but I'm thinking about the future and what else can libraries do to improve on, on the freedom. That's my takeaway. Thank you. And I, I think that actually leads to quite a, a good way of summing up that in, in, in effect, I don't know, 
libraries are an, an infrastructure, they're a, a multi-purpose infrastructure. And so people come to the library in order to fulfill any number of different goals, any number of different activities. They're not just for health, they're not just for education, they're not just for employment. And that means that, okay, they're spread across a number of areas, but they are multi-purpose. And that actually opens up that possibility to adapt. And as long as there is the skill and the support and the training available, it also means they're in a position to, to answer that question that Ugne just, just sort of put up, I don't know, because it's not purpose specific, because it's not goal specific, actually it means it's far more resilient and far more relevant over the long term as a way of actually answering some of those questions about how do we get to meaningful connectivity. So with that, and one minute over time, so it was 91 minutes, um, I, I, we are over time, Winston, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I will close and thank all of our panelists. So thank you to Maria, to Matthias, to Don, to Woro, to Ugne Online. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.